Hello, hello! Welcome back to Loki's Librarian. I am the Librarian Katrina. If you are new here, welcome. This is where I am reading through the enormous library of books you see behind me. Then I give you a quick synopsis and I tell you what I think about them. So if you like books and just aren't sure what to read next, hit that subscribe button, like and share my videos, let me know what you think in the comments. Now, a few months ago, I believe in November, I read a book on Harold Hardrada wherein I learned that he had been a member of the Varangian Guard in the Byzantine Empire, and this made me want to learn more about the Byzantine Empire. Happily, because I am a nerd who buys books, as you can see, I already had this book. God, there's a lot of reflection on that. Byzantium, The Surprising Life of a Medieval Empire by Judith Heron. This was already in my library because that's what I do. I buy books. And then because I had a booze a few months ago, I also found a cocktail to mix up called the Byzantine. It's very complicated. Muddling is involved, which I've never muddled before, but we're going to find out what this is. So let's do this. Because I've never muddled, I'm going to start with that. It does call for six basil leaves, fresh, to be muddled. In the introduction to this book, oh, it smells good. Six ba basil leaves. Judith Heron states that her goal is to make Byzantium seem a little less Byzantine. Meaning, I mean, the modern day use of the word Byzantine is something overly complex. For example, our Byzantine tax code. Right? And so she wants to make it seem less complex. This is going to be a noisy cocktail, I could tell throw some ice in there. You got to mix it with ice when you're done. To that end, this book is kind of broken down into pivotal events in Byzantine history versus doing a linear here to here. So she picks out key points in Byzantine history and tries to do her best to explain them. And even before the Byzantine Empire rose, there was Constantinople. I mean, before Rome officially fell, it essentially had split itself into two empires. And I'm sure I'm going to screw up this history some. The two empires, the East and the West, were, were ruled jointly, okay? So you had the East, which was Rome proper, and the West, which was basically Western Europe. And the two empires were ruled in conjunction, meaning the two emperors were supposed to talk to each other and their two heirs. It was a tetrarchy. There was four of them, okay? And the heirs were not necessarily the sons of the sitting empire emperors, and this caused problems because it was not blood inheritance. It was that that it was that not blood inheritance that caused this collapse of this scheme. So Constantine was the son of the Western Emperor Constantius Chlorus. And after achieving military victory in the West, he, in York actually, so he was in England, he went to Rome where he received accolades for his military success, but he was not necessarily in line to, to succeed. So then he continued on to the Bosphorus and found an ideal spot to found a city. And this is where Constantinople is. Uh, and it, I mean, it really is a naturally fortified location, okay? It's got these huge rock formations outside, which were easy to build up into walls and true fortifications. And then it's got this deep bay that they were able to draw a chain across, which we learned about in the book on Harold Hardrada. And so this was in the fourth century. This is around 330 AD. Rome did not officially fall for another hundred years. And the Byzantine Empire officially rose at that time. So even before Byzantium, we had Constantinople. Then I do one and a half ounces of gin. Now he says, he calls for a rut dry gin. I don't have that. I have aviation, not sponsored. So I'm going to do, you know, what I have on hand, which is one and a half fluid ounces. The bartender out there somewhere going, just use the shot glass. Okay. One and a half fluid ounces. Oosh. The major difference between these differences between East and West, um, was language. I mean, shocking, right? Language would be, is a major barrier to most things these days. So Byzantine in the East interpreted everything through Greek and Rome in the West interpreted everything through Latin. And so this kind of led to this divide in the church. You have the Greek Orthodox versus the Roman Catholic churches formed with Byzantium eventually inheriting the core historical in the East when Rome finished its collapse in the fifth century. And that was by design, like Constant Constantine the first there pulled as much of Rome into Byzantine or Constantinople as he could. I mean, he, he you know, adopted all of their Roman laws and their philosophy and teaching. And I mean, he, he pulled all that in by design. Um, what he couldn't pull in were the senators who were the, the 
you know, senatorial ruling class in Rome. They didn't want to leave Rome, so he created his own ruling class in Byzantine, which was based on merit. Isn't that interesting? Half ounce of passion fruit. Passion fruit syrup. In the West, the Roman Catholic Church rose to ascendancy as a political power, right? Not, it wasn't a religious power, it was a political power. I mean, it is religious, but that was their, where they maintained their, their strength was that, you know, hey, everybody must do as we say, we're the church, the church is supreme. And so the da, 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 Roman Catholic Church insisted that the heads of state, i.e. royalty, must be invested through the church in Rome. So you couldn't sit on a throne in Western Europe unless the church in Rome approved. Okay. Uh, half ounce of pat, half ounce. Now versus in the East where the church was certainly powerful, but it, it derived a lot of its power from the royal family. So that made a difference too. Um, the Byzantine Empire focused a lot on educating and feeding its people, which sounds mighty grand, but you couldn't just walk into any bread line in Byzantine and be like, hey, I like my daily ration. You had to actually prove you were a citizen of the Byzantine Empire to get that bread. Um, but you could be educated. You know, if you, if you were a likely person, generally male, you could be educated. Constantinople, because it was already this growing and sprawling metropolis when Rome fell, the Byzantine Empire kind of kept going, rose out of Constantinople, becoming the center of learning, religion, and culture, as well as the gateway to Asia, North Africa, and Eastern Europe, kind of leaving the barbarian tribes in Western Europe to form their own countries, which they did, right? That's where we get Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, England. Those all rose up out of the Western lands. Um, and the author makes the argument that without the rise of Islam, which pushed back against Byzantine rule and swept across North Africa and Mediterranean, uh, the European countries of France, Spain, Italy, Germany might not even exist. Uh, I don't know about that. I, I, I think she makes a, an interesting argument, but her, her argument is that because Islam came up through Spain and got stopped at the Pyrenees Mountains, I, I mean, France put up Charles Martel and, and Charlemagne and they began to fight back and that's how France rose. England rose was basically this push back against Islam. Maybe. It's a plausible theory. But I mean, like all things, the biggest split between the East and the West was religious. <clears throat> they were both Christian, but the Byzantine translated their Bible through Greek, the Romans took the Latin, and this changed history. Um, I mean, Rome was certainly no slouch in commissioning new churches, I mean, hence all the cathedrals across Europe. Uh, in Constantinople, they built the Hagia Sophia in 537, and that still stands today. I mean, it... it I think it still is a World Heritage Site, but it's currently used as a mosque in Istanbul, so it, it's a religious site as well. It's not something you would just go to as a tourist, I don't think. I mean, maybe it is, maybe they have guided tours, but I, I honestly don't know. And while Byzantine was concentrated in the East, right after Rome collapsed, the Byzantine Empire did not make a claim to the whole of the Roman Empire. I mean, theoretically, they could have, which would have included a huge chunk of Europe, but they didn't. So they left it open. What's my next one? Oh, one or a half fluid ounce of lime and lemongrass cordial, which I couldn't find anywhere. So I made mine, which means it's non-alcoholic. I mean, I suppose you could get it alcoholic, but you know, not if you're making it yourself. I guess I could have. Half lime and lemongrass cordial. It's going to be a very flavorful cocktail, whatever it is. The cordial is pretty good too. It's really sweet. And then two fluid ounces of pineapple juice. Now, while it didn't actually spread to the West, the Byzantine emperors did make a try and make a claim to the whole of the Roman Empire, which included Italy, which results in many Byzantine mosaics of the Byzantine royal families being in Italy, even though they may not have necessarily been there. They were the sitting royalty. The, the Italy at least recognized them for a while, and so there you go. And because, so during the seventh century, God, I'm jumping all over the place. I'm sorry. The book kind of did this though. It jumped all over. And I, and I know I addressed that in the back half of this, but I kind of just jumped all over because the book jumped all over. During the seventh century, so 632, I think, I think that's when the Arabian tribes discovered Islam, which unified them. They pushed back against Christianity of Byzantium, which held them in the East, okay? Which is why 
Islam ended up coming up around through the Mediterranean into Spain because they couldn't get past the Byzantine Empire and Constantinople at that time. At that time. And Islam was kind of a unifying force. Initially, it was perfectly acceptable to be Christian or Jewish in Islamic lands. You had to pay higher taxes for your belief, but there was no law against it. They weren't forcibly converting anybody, uh, being because everybody was considered people of the book at the time. The lingering paganism in parts of Italy and across northern Europe would not have been acceptable, but Arabian forces never got that far, which left the Christian churches to deal with the heathen hordes of Scandinavian countries and the lingering bits of the old Roman religions. Now during this time, Orthodox churches, the Orthodox Church went through a period of struggle on how to worship, meaning do we allow icons or not? Because that's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not worship graven images. So that kind of iconography ran up against iconoclasm and it was like do we destroy them all or do we worship them and ultimately a couple of the empresses in Byzantine were the deciding factor and they said no we're going to worship icons we're going to allow iconography in our churches two fluid ounces of pineapple juice and no I cannot find smaller freaking things of fruit juices to save my life pineapple juice so that's all for those for now and I have to shake this up. Pour it over ice. Ice. Well, it says you'd fill it up with tonic water, but honest to God, maybe if I had a bigger cup, I'd fill it up with tonic water. Well, it's pretty mellow. A little sweet, but there's a lot of sugar in it, so okay. But it's pretty mellow. Oh, look at this. My door's open. Perfect for cats to get in. Iconography versus not. And part of what made people go, mm, we should get rid of icons. Uh-huh. See? A cat got in here. A cat got in here. So you still had these, part of what made them go, um, icons, do we allow icons or not, was this kind of lingering paganism. Uh, because people would say, oh, well, I you know, want a picture of Christ, but I really want him to look like Apollo. And the artist would be like, well, I mean, it's money. It's a commission, so I'll do it. And, of course, the church didn't like that one little bit. You're not supposed to do images unless it is of the holy, you know, holy son of God. So... That may have led to this kind of division between iconophiles and iconoclasts. Um, but again, two, two of the empresses who sat in the 8th century, yes, 8th century, uh, were firmly on the side of let's, let's allow religious imagery. And so that stuck. And so we have a lot of these really beautiful images. However, the oldest are from about 800 AD because of the iconoclasm that happened. So a lot of the early religious symbols were destroyed because they weren't sure if they were going to allow it in their churches. All of these arguments that were, you know, icon iconography versus not, was hotly debated by everybody because Byzantine had a very high rate of literacy and education. I mean, even women could read. And they may not be able to write, but they could certainly read. And they pulled that old Roman le level or system of education in and they focused on classical topics. So based on the, quote, seven liberal arts of antiquity, there were three literary topics, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. We should really be teaching that these days. And followed by four mathematical ones, arithmetic, geometry, harmonics, and astronomy. So again, all of, and all of these things are actually still used today. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and they were probably better educated than your average 21st century college undergrad. <laughs> since we allow such ridiculous specializations these days. I'll put a little tonic water in just to see what it does. So they took that education and they used it to reach out to the Slavic people of Western Europe, of Western Russia and Eastern Europe, okay? They used the, they created alphabets, which became the Cyrillic alphabet, still in use today in those countries. And this allowed them to create Bibles and written verses. It's probably supposed to be mostly tonic. I feel like I should have used a bigger cup. That's sexy. So anyways, when they created the Bible and the written verses for the Slavic people, this helped them to convert. So we, that's why we have a lot of Orthodox churches in Eastern Europe and Russia was because they used this education to create an alphabet to communicate with them. That didn't happen in Western Europe until the Reformation with Martin Luther King. Uh, yeah, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, <laughs> with Martin Luther. 15th century, was that Martin Luther? He's a 15th or 16th century was Martin Luther, but his Reformation, you know, the 99 Theses, you may or may not have learned about that in school. That's what helps fuel the, hey, people should be able to read. 
people should be able to read their Bible. Well, they believe that already in the East. So that's a lot of information so far. And it's not always linear. It does jump around quite a bit. And it makes a little bit confusing. Okay. Among the many things that any nation state can do to protect itself, creating weapons of war remains high on the list. Um, I know, we're all supposed to be peace-loving hippies and can't we all just get along? Um, the history of humanity says no. We cannot all get along. And it's not just Europeans, all right? Humans suck. It's what we do. We tend to be tribal. And when you find your tribe, you try to beat everybody else into submission. Turn on the news if you don't believe me. Byzantine had one of the most, or Byzantium, I guess, had one of the most effective weapons for its time. It's called Greek fire. Now, nobody really knows the current formula. I think she mentioned somebody in here who, who managed to sort of recreate it. I don't know how accurate the recreation is. But essentially, it's an incendiary weapon mostly used for ship battles in the bay. And the formula has been lost since at least the fall of Constantinople. It may have been lost before then, but it's definitely been gone since Constantinople fell. I mean, it's almost like napalm, but water just makes it burn more. <laughs> so, and, and it's an excellent weapon to use at sea, right? Because there's no way to put the fire out. I mean, water, water everywhere, but you can't use it to put out the fire. And the Byzantines used it most effectively to secure their harbor, which in turn protected trade. The Byzantine economy was kept fairly strong. I mean, for most of its 1100 year operation, right? It had a very solid gold standard. And I, and I mean most of it, because there was one, right around 1,000, the, the sitting emperor at that time devalued the gold. So for 700 years, 300 to 1,000, it was gold coin minted in Byzantium was minted of 24 karat gold. And that was the standard currency for all trade within the empire. And it was widely accepted everywhere, even outside the empire because it was solid gold. So there was no question of its value. And then around 1000 for reasons that have not been explained, or at least had not been explained at the time this book was written, the emperor decided to begin devaluing the coin by mixing in silver with the smelting. And that dropped the once 24 karat gold coins, ultimately to about 5% gold with the balance being a silver alloy. Since these coins were known to be junk and most merchants would not accept them because they didn't meet the original gold standard, this devalued currency, and they kind of went through a dark period where people wouldn't really trade with them because their money was shit. And then you had the Khomeini family rose to power with Alexios I, and he reinstated the gold standard, and the Byzantine currency once again became a trading standard. Now, interestingly, we know all of this from a book written by Alexios I's daughter, Anna Khomeini. Uh, it's translated in English as the Alexiad, and it's like a 500-page book in modern English. Um, was written between 1137 and her death in 1153. And it's the history of the Khomeini family, but specifically of her father. And this is one of the few historical texts we have that was written by an absolute contemporary, right? I mean, remember when I was doing Harold Hardrada, all the sources were pulled from, or written like two to 300 years after the fact of the events that they were portraying. So hers was written as an absolute contemporary. She was there at the moment. She, she took, you know, eyewitness statements from people who were at battles that she couldn't be in because she was a woman and Byzantine women didn't fight. So I have, I mean, it's kind of invaluable. I haven't read it yet. The author, though, assures us that it's an invaluable source in understanding Byzantium at that point in time, which I have no reason to doubt. Histories are typically written after the fact, but histories written in the moment kind of provide us with a provide us with a bird's eye view of what's going on. So I think that would be an interesting historical perspective. And it also speaks to the level of education that was provided to Byzantine women. I mean, granted, Anna Komnani was royalty, so her education may even have been higher than most men's, but it's an interesting perspective that should definitely not be overlooked. Most interesting during this time, and only rarely seen in the West, was the use of eunuchs. Seriously. Typically, when I thought of eunuchs at all, I would think of them in terms of the Arab tribes and Islamic states, right? Used to protect the sultan's harems. And this is uh, grossly inaccurate, or one-sided, I should say. Uh, certainly, it was there during the, during the Arab tribes in, in Islam. But eunuchs existed throughout Byzantine Empire and in parts of the West. I mean, most notably, the famed Castrati Choir in Venice, which existed, I think, into the early, early part of the 20th century. They would castrate these young boys to get that super high voice. 
Um, and in, in the Byzantine Empire, it was, it was a path to power. If, if you were willing to give that up, then you could rise very high as a eunuch at court. And not just as a bodyguard for the royal family, but the eunuchs could be valued advisors, they could be generals. I think one even sat as an emperor. I don't think he was emperor, but this is one of the things that I disliked about this book is that it wasn't always crystal clear because it wasn't a linear history. Anyways. The use of eunuchs was so creepy to the West that they used that as part of their justification for raiding Byzantine, Byzantium, Constantinople specifically, in 1204. Um, as in any empire, the imperial court sets the tone for how things were run, but they were by no means the be-all, end-all of the empire. And that's kind of what the author was shooting for with this book, was showing that there were a lot of different parts that made the whole. But one of Byzantine's contributions to posterity was a large civil administration, which allowed for more or less seamless transitions between emperors. It's kind of where the idea of a Byzantine administration comes from. But one of their most effective conceits was the concept of porphyrogenitos, being born in the purple. Not just meaning to the royal family, to whom the color purple was exclusively reserved, but in the royal palace, there was literally an all-purple birthing chamber. Um, to be born porphyro, porphyrogenitos was to confer a special level of imperialism. And one emperor, I think it was Constantine VIII, actually made it illegal to export Byzantine princesses who were born porphyrogenitos, wanting to reserve those royal matches to significant followers within the empire. Now, there were some exceptions. They were sometimes specifically ignored. Um, notably, Basil II married his sister Anna to uh, Vladimir of Kiev, who was, the emperor, who was the Rus king, to secure an alliance there. And that is ultimately what led to Harold Hardrada being a Varangian guard 40 years later. So it was kind of interesting to see, the, and it's, she actually specifically mentions Harold Hardrada and that Rus connection when he comes to Byzantine. Being born in the purple was an especially exalted status and really a clever bit of marketing for you know a thousand years ago so much so that incoming imperial families even if they were not born in the purple would claim the t title and status of porphyrogenitos just as a matter of course because they were royalty they must have been right, let's see what this is like with tonic water I, think I liked it better without the tonic water yeah. now the advent of the crusades to win back the holy land from the arab infidels Yes, I'm rolling my eye. It created an opportunity to unite the Christian churches of the East, of West, East and West, um, which didn't happen. Because the church in Rome kept insisting that the Orthodox Church of the Byzant Byzantine Empire acknowledge Rome's ascendancy, and the Orthodox churches continually refused. They were like, no, we've got our own way of doing things. We're all Christian. Can't we just get along? Well, history of humanity says no. We can't just get along. And this ultimately led to the sacking of Constantinople by Western Knights in 1204. Theoretically, they were on their way to the Crusades and they stopped for a little <laughs> rape and sack in 1204 at Constantinople. And it led to a roughly 60 year period where the Byzantine Empire was looked over by Latin Knights from the West. Um, and 60 years doesn't sound like much, right? In an 1,100-year history, that's a blip. It's a blink of an eye time-wise. But that 60-year period allowed many of the smaller cities to break away and form their own city-states. And those city-states ultimately became vassals of the Ottoman Turks, which directly led to the Turks taking over Constantinople in 1453. So that was... On little things like that, history turns, right? If um, Basil II had married his sister to the Russian king, we might never have had Harold Hardrada as part of the Varangian Guard. And if the Western Knights hadn't sacked Constantinople in 1204, then the empire might have remained united and might have withstood Ottoman Turkish rule forever, possibly, conceivably. We'll never know, right? That's That's one of those things that history turns and changes. Now much like other empires, including the empire of these United States, eventually wealth disparity becomes a thing. Now I'm not going to go into a capitalism versus feudalism because they're two completely separate systems. They're nowhere near alike. Um, 
But in Byzantium, they did eventually develop a semi-feudal state, which was very much along the lines of what was seen in Western Europe. And the uh, peasants rebelled. However, while in the West, people would rarely rebel, in Byzantium, it became a go-to move, and they rebelled quite frequently. It was interesting, and this is not a direct comparison, I just particularly appreciate the irony, that those who claim to speak for the pre peasant class were rarely actually peasants. <laughs> That's very familiar to what's going on these days. Um, but they sure like to stoke the fires of discontent, resulting in rebellion and mob rule through the last two centuries of Byzantine rule. Then in 1451, the Ottoman Turks, who had been slowly creeping across the Byzantine Empire, made their way to the walls of Constantinople, and with the help of new weaponry, a uh, large cannon that hurled multi-ton cannonballs at the walls, they were able to breach Constantinople in 1453, which ended the Byzantine Empire and cemented the rise of the Ottomans as the dominant power in the east, which lasted for the next 600 years. Uh, the, the Ottoman Empire ultimately fell at the very end of World War I, and that was when they collapsed. So this book is a very, very broad overview of Byzantine history, and it is not told in a linear fashion. I, I mean, it vaguely is. All right? It starts with Constantinople, and it ends with, the, with, with Byzantine's fall in the Ottoman Turks in 1453, but everything in between is, is a bit jumbled, and it was a little hard to follow. And once I stopped looking for a strictly linear story and started reading each chapter, like literally each chapter as a standalone essay, it was quite enjoyable. And I, I will definitely keep the book in my library because if I ever want to know specifically about um, like monkish orders, for example, she has a chapter on that uh, regarding Mount Athos and how the the that's what I'm looking for. How, how the monks worshipped. They, they believed in silence and meditation, which was different from how it was in the West, where they might have group prayer sessions, right? So she has a chapter that specifically addresses that. She has a chapter specifically on the luxuries of the Byzantine Empire, which included the fork, which existed in Rome, but fell out of disuse in Western Europe, but the Byzantines kept it. And that was seen as uh, plush and over the top from a luxury perspective on the West. So she has specific chapters on those. So if I want to know where that is, well, now I know it's in this book, but it's not a linear history. So if you want something from Constantine the first through Manuel the second, she does have at the very, very end, and I did like this, a complete list of the emperors. Constantine the 11th Paleologos was the, uh, was the final emperor. Oh yeah. Because when, when the Ottoman Turks, Turks knocked down the walls and flooded into Constantinople, they never found his body. So for a while there, they thought, you know, people were saying, he's going to come back and rescue us. And well, he never did because probably he died in the rubble somewhere. So it starts, you know, with Constantine the first, ends with Constantine the 11th, and there's like 80 emperors in between. So if you're looking for this linear history, you're not going to find it here. You will find a very broad overview. She does a good job there. It's a broad overview of what came out of the Byzantine Empire. But honestly, I was a bit frustrated reading through the first section because it jumped around so much. But once I went, okay, we'll read them like they're standalone essays, it got better. And I started to enjoy it more because I was like, okay, well, this chapter we're learning about the purple birthing chamber. <laughs> Literally a whole chapter about the purple birthing chamber. Um, this chapter we're learning specifically about Anna Komnene. Cool. All right. But there was very little tying each chapter to the next. Um, but, I mean, the knowledge just kind of snuck up on me. I mean, I, when I was writing this write-up and, and the, the blog posting, I wasn't even referring to the book because so much of it had sunk in, so that was good. I mean, that means it was interesting enough to pull my attention and, and to sink it in kind of osmotically. Um, so if you want to know about and understand individual bits of Byzantine history, this is a good book. If you're looking for a linear timeline on how the emperors each rose to power, uh, not so much. 
I mean, when I said I was going to do a book on Byzantium, I had several friends who love the subject offer up books to be read, and I was like, nah, I got a book, I got a book, I'm going to read that one. I think I may have to borrow some of those books and see what else I can learn. I mean, 1100 years of history, it would be impossible to cram it all into one book, especially since it's entirely possible that there has been a book written about each and every one of these emperors on their own. So that would be 80. I mean, good God, I could read literally a book about an emperor every week, which I'm not going to do. I mean, if I wanted to turn this into the all Byzantine channel, I could, but I could read one about an emperor a week and it would take me two years to get through it. But she did a respectable job hitting the highlights, I think. That's it for this week. Let me know what you think in the comments. I will see you all next week. Bye.